Hi, Hi. my name is is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California, and welcome to the online forum. In the 1960s, three quarters of American children lived in families with two first time married heterosexual parents. Today, fewer than half do. The conventional family has broken into a multitude of perfect families, including gay families, multi-parent families, adoptive families, foster families, families built through assisted reproduction, single parent headed families, and child free families. What does it mean to be an ideal family in America today? And for families learning to deal with their exceptional children, to what extent should parents accept their children for who they are? And to what extent should they help them become their best selves? And this year, when the cathedral is exploring the theme of healing, we want to ask how we make peace with difference and the most fundamental of relationships. My guest tonight, Andrew Solomon, has written extensively about families, particularly in his books, New Family Values and Far From the Tree. He's professor of clinical medical psychology at Columbia University Medical Center, a winner of the National Book Award, and an activist in the LGBTQ plus rights, mental health, and the arts. Andrew, thank you very much for joining me. Well, what a pleasure to be here. I'm honored and delighted. I um, wanted to ask you the question that everybody's asking everybody else, and that is, what are you learning in COVID? Like, how is COVID changing your perspective on things? How do things look different as a result of this massive change that we're going through together? Well, COVID has had two simultaneous and apparently opposite effects. One is that it has caused people to experience terrible isolation. And the other is that it has caused people to experience terrible intimacy. Most people who are going through COVID are cut off from their larger social circle, but they may be locked in a little less now as vaccines proliferate, but have been for a long time locked in with a small group of people who are usually their family and hopefully are people they love. But no matter how much you love people, the experience of being incarcerated with them for a year is a very emotionally intense experience. And I've seen an enormous shift in people's consciousness throughout this COVID period. So that there are people who had always thought of themselves as lonely and who now feel oppressed by the company of others. And there are people who had always thought of themselves as social who have withdrawn into this relative isolation. So I've watched all of that happening around me. Um, I've had personal losses that have been connected both to the physical uh, health crisis and to the mental health crisis that have accompanied COVID. Um, It's been a time of enormous learning. I feel very fortunate in that my children are now 12 and 13. It's been difficult for them, but it's been a lovely time to be Um, immersed in the um, experience of fatherhood with an intensity that might otherwise not have dawned at this juncture. Yeah, I wonder, it seems like so many more people talk about a relation to the outer world, that part of being isolated from people at work or in schools, et cetera. And people haven't talked as much about just like that that sex sense of just being like having a really intense experience of of, of that, that, those people we usually call our family. Do do you think there's a reason for that? Or are we just too... Yeah, I'm totally curious what you're... (laughs) Well, years ago, when I was writing The Noonday Demon, which was my book about depression, I went to study depression among the Greenlandic Inuit, where there's a very high rate of suicide and a high rate of clinical depression. And I had assumed that the reason for that was that it's dark um, for six months of the year, the sun doesn't come up. But what I discovered was that the Inuit are in general um, well adapted to the season of darkness. And that the issue is that in Greenland, um, there is no natural source of fuel. People used to live in igloos. You can't imagine how small a normal igloo is. They now live mostly in Danish prefab housing. And it's too dark and too cold to leave the house. Maybe the man at the house goes to get food every so often. Other than that, you're in an igloo actually physically on top of other people, which was how they stayed warm, or you're in these small rooms and you're constantly together with people. And the result of that is enormous emotional repression because if you have a terrible fight with your mother-in-law and you can't move farther than six feet away from her, you're putting yourself into a pretty difficult situation. And I discovered that that intensity of exposure to one another actually is the reason for uh, a lot of the depression that the Greenlandic Inuit experience. They experience many other things also. I don't want to speak 
ill of the Inuit. I had amazing experiences with people and they had extraordinary insights, but uh, you know, too much intimacy is overpowering for people and we're sort of embarrassed to admit it. I mean, Sartre, when he did um, No Exit, Wiklo, um, essentially said hell is other people. And right, I remember that. With other people <laughs> you can't escape from. And I think no matter how much you love people, no matter how much you love your spouse, your children, your parents, that constant, constant, constant exposure and the disappearance of anything that resembles privacy is painful but it's okay to say it's painful for me to be alone. We as a society think ill of aloneness and think of aloneness as a sad condition. And it's embarrassing to say being with these people whom I essentially love very much actually has been very uncomfortable for me. That runs against the social norms of our time and people are ashamed of themselves for having those feelings and the shame only compounds the feelings and makes it harder and worse. I, I completely agree. And there also is a sense of betrayal too when you say, listen, the people who I'm living close, list, closely with are driving me crazy. And so it is hard to talk about that. I love that, um, that there are those two um, things that are happening and they're such an asymmetrical experience in terms of how we can talk about them. It's, it's much more socially acceptable to talk about missing everybody at work than it is to talk about how your spouse is making you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up the noonday demon because I, I, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you just about depression. And what do you think are the things about depression that, that um, most people don't know, but that they should know? Well, the first thing to know is that depression is unbelievably common. Um, it's much more common than you realize, even in this day when people speak out about it more. I would suggest you try writing a book about depression and you will find that over the course of a year, every person you have ever met comes to you and says, I've been having this terrible problem, or I'm really worried about my sister, or there's someone at work who I think might not make it or whatever else it is that they make. So I think people don't recognize how common it is. I think and the I World think Health Organization also, says it's the most serious illness that afflicts humankind, right? It's, it's the most pervasive, right? Um, the World Health Organization says that it um, costs more useful uh, hours of uh, right. human life yeah. than any other, uh, any other complaint. But it's also, it's in many instances, not all, but in many instances, very treatable. But we don't understand very well which treatments will work for which people. And so you have to be unbelievably patient and depression robs you of your patience as one of its very symptoms. You have to be unbelievably patient in trying different approaches, perhaps medications, you may go through many of them, perhaps some kind of talk therapy, perhaps an alternative treatment of some kind, the thing that people lose when they're depressed is any sense of hope. And what you need to do when you're depressed is to remember that hope is not just a fiction. It isn't just a funny little thing that we've come up with to make ourselves feel better. That, that hope is real and that many people either are able to live lives in which their depression is well controlled or are able to find great meaning in their lives, at least in the interstices between their depressive episodes. Yeah, that's such an important message to get out to people. Um, I remember in, uh, I think it was in 2012, 2013, when a very dear friend of mine, Eric Twan, gave me your Far From the Tree book. And I, I, it was just like, it was, I think it's most one of the most important books I've read in the last 10 years. I I, I immediately, and I, I, I felt badly for the poor church that I was serving because I every week it would be another story <laughs> from the tree. And by the way, I preached pretty much about you entirely yesterday. <laughs> oh, I'm so, yeah, so there's probably, and I, I know I'm not the only one. There's going to be a lot of sermons out there. You should just Google your name with sermon in it sometime. Um, but, you know, I, I love the categories of uh, the chapters, schizophrenia, um, deaf, uh, autism, um, rape, um, all of the chapters are so powerful. And I wonder if there were, were, were um, category, I mean, in the beginning of your most recent book, the, um, the, new, the, the new Family Values book, you talk about how that book is a book about um, extraordinary people who are in ordinary families and the, the New Family Values is about extraordinary families with ordinary people. But how did you decide what chapters to include in Far From the Tree? And like what, what, what got left out? Like what didn't fit into that schema 
Well, I mean, there was a list of hundreds of um, possible chapters that I considered, and there were dozens that I considered seriously, and then there were 10 categories that I went with. Um, the book, as many people will know, I trust from your sermons, was about how families deal with having children who weren't what they had in mind when they set out to have children. The chapter that was in some ways the most shocking one for me was the one about families of people who commit crimes, having assumed always that people committed crimes because they came from unsupportive, unloving, traumatic backgrounds. I discovered that many of them came from backgrounds in which they had been well-loved and cherished and had nonetheless turned to lives of extreme destructiveness. So I was interested in that dynamic. But what did I leave out? I mean, one of the things I left out actually was how parents of great faith deal with having atheist children, or indeed how atheist parents deal with having children who move toward evangelical Christianity or other um, uh, apparently extreme versions of religiosity and uh, how that's undertaken. I thought about um, writing about people with various kinds of gigantism. I thought about writing about blindness. I thought about actually writing, just because I thought it would have made a pleasant break in the middle of it, about um, ordinary looking parents whose children become supermodels and how those relationships unfold. But the reality is that all families all parents imagine their children before their children are born. It's one of the primary activities that occurs during a pregnancy. You think what your child will be like and nobody's child ever comes out the way that he or she was imagined ahead of time. And so- Because there's no uh, such thing as reproduction. Because <laughs> so that process of figuring out how do I go about being a good parent to this child who isn't the child I had imagined how do I do that? It's a it's a major challenge. And that really, I found could apply, you know, as I say, to, it applies to everyone. You know, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that you mentioned the crime chapter, because that was definitely the chapter I, I remember preaching about the most. Um, but when people come up to you and talk to you about the book, you know, what chapters do they talk about? What 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 do they what do they say to you what, in terms of what they learned or what they have to add or or, or you know, which 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 sections did they focus on? They focus on the chapter that pertains most closely to their own experience. Oh, that's interesting. So people will come up and will say, you know, my grandmother was deaf and therefore da 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 da. Or they will say, um, you know, my child didn't commit the kind of serious crimes you're describing, but acted out very badly at school and I was very troubled by that, or whatever it may be. I mean, and what people talk about has changed over time. When I started working on that book in 2002, I said there was a chapter on transgender children and most of the people I met said, transgender children? What are you talking about? How can children be transgender? And now it's difficult to find a glossy magazine that isn't currently featuring transgender children on its cover. It's sort of all over the place. So um, as the discourse shifts around these various topics, people come to um, one or another element of them. My idea was that the first half of the book were really conditions that were physical. I mean, autism, you know, you could argue all kinds of things, but it has been classified fairly obviously as an illness and it appears to fit a lot of the models that exist of disease and the attempt to break down the notion that it is a disease is very vigorous, but is going against a tradition. And then in the second part of the book, to look at families bringing up children of rape and to look at families of people who committed crimes and to look at families of people who were transgender and to try to understand in looking at those um, uh, kinds of families, how the difference between yourself and your child may be genetic, may be environmental, or may be social, and may just be what your child does or doesn't choose to do, or what your child does or doesn't value. Um, and I think that for people who actually make it through um, to those later chapters, those are the ones often that people find most shocking and that they most want to ask about. Yeah, the schizophrenia chapter was very hard for me. Just, I, I see so many people who are suffering with schizophrenia on the streets every single day. And to think that um, that deinstitutionalization, deinstitutionalization, that it, it, that we we make these social choices that leave people in in just in, in just horrible places is, was 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 really heartbreaking. And going back over it again, um, that was what really stu stuck with me this time too. You know, um, it's funny because. Um, reading the Far From the Tree and then listening to the audiobook of the new American, the new family values, um, it really gave me a, a new appreciation for you as an interviewer yourself. 
Um, and I, it, because, I, you know, I can see you at work in that new family values. And I, I wonder if you have any advice. I mean, we're about to go back to being together again. And I, I, I really do believe that every person that I encounter has something that's valuable and worthwhile. If I can just get the right question or express the right. And I wonder if you have any advice just to how did you learn to do interviews and, and, and what advice do you have for ordinary people who are just trying to, 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 to keep the conversation going and, and, and move to a deeper place? When I was growing up, my mother always used to say to me, never forget that a good listener is more interesting than a good talker. So I'm talking today, you're interviewing me, but I think the idea of trying to be a good listener was instilled in me from an early age. And what I found over time is that most people really want to talk about themselves and their experiences and their stories, but are afraid to do so. They're afraid of judgment. They're afraid of looking foolish. They're afraid of not being able to convey what it is they have to say. And that really, I mean, the secret to whatever level of good interviewing I've been able to achieve has mostly been um, to try to listen, as I think you have to in your line of work, but to try to listen non-judgmentally um, and to try to make people feel safe, not safe in the kind of politically correct safe space sense that gets bandied around now as university policy, but safe in that they will not encounter any form of harm by virtue of having told you what's actually going on in their um, hearts or in their lives. You, that is so well communicated in um, New Family Values, by the way. I mean, it, it just it, it, everywhere in that, it's it, 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 there, there's this sense of I'm curious about what what it is that you have here, and you know I love you no matter what. <laughs> I, 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 how did you how did it become an audio book instead of a written book? Because that that definitely got me out of my shell. Where I I had to basically have headphones and walking around the house all the time instead of being able to curl up in my corner reading my book in the normal way. Well, I'm in the process of writing a book. It was okay. Pre- you kind of mentioned that book, book. Yeah. right? And so um, I had begun to think about the book that I wanted to write and I was feeling overwhelmed by it as I often feel overwhelmed by my own projects before they're realized. And I was approached by the people at Audible and they said, we'd love you to make an audio book about depression. And I said, I've said what I have to say about depression. I don't mind updating it a bit, but I don't want to do a whole audio book about depression. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, it would be great to get started on the kind of interviewing I need to do for the next book I'm planning to write. And so we pulled together um, New Family Values as a sort of teaser for the book that I'll ultimately write. It was great because the process of soliciting people for interviews, I find sort of agonizing. I mean, I do it, but I hate calling up total strangers and saying, um, I'd like you to tell me the deepest secrets of your life. And uh, there was a group of people uh, I was working with at Audible and it was a collaborative process. And that was a good way for me to kind of break through um, to researching these um, to researching these subjects. I don't mean to suggest that the audiobook doesn't stand on its own. I'm, I'm fond of it, and I hope others who have listened to it will have found it interesting and moving, but it's a sort of scratching of the surface of what I'm investigating in the book I'm now writing, which is called Who Rocks the Cradle? Uh, how do you decide how personal to be in, in stories about your own life in, in, in books like Far From the Tree or, or this um, the new book that your project that you're working on? Well, I end up being personal in many of these instances because I think it's my personal experience that qualifies me to talk about these subjects and to ask other people about them. So I really felt in Far From the Tree that my experience growing up as the gay child of straight parents was in some ways the defining experience of my life and that it was unfair and and almost rude to ask other people to talk about the difficult complexities of their families and not reveal the complexities of my own. Now, people will read the books and then say, I feel like you and I are good friends. And I think, (laughs) well, I mean, only a very particular part of myself that I've chosen to put out there. Um, But uh, it seems like a, a almost a point of honor. If other people will tell their stories as fully as they can, I'll go ahead and tell mine as fully as I can. I also tend to think that um, we live in an era in which um, there's a lot of conversation about privacy 
some of which is um, uh, grounded in very um, sound points of view, but I think privacy, people's sense of privacy often results in other people feeling alone. And that while there are some privacies to which everyone is entitled, that sometimes the idea of privacy gets abused. And so I want not to write books in which I'm holding back secrets. They don't tell everything about me. And there are aspects of my life that I haven't talked about so far, but I don't want the book to feel withholding. I would like my writing to feel generous. That's the objective, whether it's accomplished or not. Yeah, well, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote about um, listening to a preacher in the Unitarian Church in Concord, Massachusetts in you know 1820 or something. And he said, this, 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 the, you couldn't tell from anything he said that he lived or died, that he loved things or didn't love things. It, it was, it was, the, the, he was giving you nothing personal. And he said the snowstorm outside was so much more alive. Um, but preaching is constant that question. And most of it has to do with just like the, the people that you're mentioning who are kind of implicated in your life. Like, so it, it you know, how, you know, deciding about how much of the children's life to put in and talking to, I talk to my kids about, you know, is it okay if I tell them the story of this? Is it okay if I um, do that? But um, it's, it's definitely a question that comes up a lot for me. Um, and you're right. I, I think there's a way in which we can be so unpersonal that that um we don't give people a chance to really find connections and 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 that's so much that's so important to, to being human um one of the my favorite personal stories from from the different books was the story of you and your dad in the car talking about the holocaust where where your dad is explaining it to you um, when you're a boy and um you saying well why didn't they just leave and your dad said well they had nowhere to go to and i i love that like as a story that showed you how important it was to, 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 to be a citizen of the world, which is your last sentence in the whole book is about being a citizen of the world. They're, they're so connected to each other. But I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, just like what trap, I mean, that was a guiding story for, for you when you were a young person um, first beginning to travel. And I wonder if you can talk about what you're learning about travel just as, as a father when you travel with your children, like how different is it than, than the, that kind of formative story that, that you had with your father? Well, that was in the introduction to Far and Away, which is a collection of my international reporting, um, some of which was to write about very grave situations. I reported from Afghanistan and from Rwanda and from other places that have been very troubled. And some of it was travel writing about places I went to and had a grand old time. But I think I did have that sense from early childhood that it was important to have friends everywhere and to have options. I have been in the sort of slow process of looking into whether I can claim Romanian and Polish citizenship because I had one grandparent born in Romania and one born in Poland. I have British citizenship, which was of course European citizenship until quite recently, which is sort of the engine of seeking out Polish and Romanian. Um, but I always wanted to feel, you know, that if things fell apart, I wasn't going to be one of those people who was stuck. I was going to have there were going to be places to go. And I wanted my children to have that sense too, that you can actually make things work anywhere in the world you want to. You can be at home, any place. And we started traveling with the children when they were very little. And people said, that's ridiculous. He's two years old. He's never going to remember Paris. And I said, okay, he may not remember it. I said, in the first place, one doesn't have one's experiences only for the sake of memories. I said, in the second place, I will remember going to Paris and I had a good time. But in the third place, and I think crucially, he will grow up from the earliest stage knowing that the world is a big place, that people live differently in different parts of it, and that he can have all kinds of, he, my son in this instance, can have all kinds of experiences um, in all kinds of places, and that he can decide where and how he wants to live, and to some extent, therefore, who it is that he wants to be. And my children are both incredibly enthusiastic travelers and love being out in the world. And the fact that that experience, which having talked about its sort of urgency and coming out of Holocaust study has also been one of the great joys of my life, is one of the great joys of my children's lives, that, that fills me with delight. Oh, that's great. I, I, I love that. I, we um, took our children to Africa when I, I, I was on sabbatical. Uh, it was like the only place we could ever afford to go because I received this crazy grant to go. And uh, and it was the same. You're right. Our oldest child was five and our youngest was three or something. And 
And it was, it, it is still, it's such a huge part of our life. It's like that one section of our life is just so much bigger than all the normal, ordinary years that we, we had. Um, one of my favorite stories is when you're um, part of the artists collective in um, Russia and um, I, um, Nikita Alexiev says to you, we've been preparing ourselves to be not great artists, but angels. And I wonder what artists are, are interesting to you now and, and, and just um, what your thoughts are, are on the art world um, at, at this stage in your life. It's very poignant that you bring that up. Nikita died two weeks ago. Oh, no. Um, and oh. was a beloved friend. And I've been thinking about him a great deal. And I've quoted that line when people said to me, wait, which one was he? And yeah. I keep saying, well, he did this kind of art. And he lived in this place and so on. And then I say, and he was the one who said, we were in training to be not artists, but angels. Um, and uh, yeah. It was very yeah. powerful. When I started writing about artists in Russia, which was when I was in my early 20s, um, uh, it happened through odd ha happenstance. I was writing the arts column for a glossy magazine in London and Sotheby's was having a sale of contemporary Soviet art and the magazine agreed to send me there. And I met these artists and my life was really deeply and profoundly changed by them and changed by them on a permanent basis. And at the time, the assumption was that art that was made outside of the Western mainstream either looked like what was being made here, in which case it was derivative, or it looked different from what was being made here, in which case it looked it was provincial. Um, there was sort of no tolerance for the idea that there might actually be really interesting things going on elsewhere. And I wrote about artists in Russia and I wrote about artists in China and now, of course, the art world has um, globalized uh, dramatically. And, you know, most of the most famous artists in the world these days seem to come from um, from China, but they, they didn't then. And what I was struck by in meeting those artists and what Nikita was referring to and saying we were in training to be angels is that they felt that they had a moral responsibility to keep the idea of truth alive in societies that they perceived as trying to destroy truth itself. And it was a great calling for them. And so unlike most of the artists who were effectively quite cynical working in Western contexts at the time, or who were just overtly uh, commercial, these artists really believed that if they kept truth alive, they would be able to shout it from the rooftops when the time finally came when it was possible to do so. Now, years later, those artists themselves have become somewhat more cynical. The governments that they resisted have in some instances fallen or have been transformed, and they're all sort of wedged into a commercial gallery-based system. But I still think that art with a moral purpose is the art that is most interesting to me. And I think there are people making it two blocks away from my house in New York right now and two blocks away from where you are sitting right. um, in San Francisco and also in all of these parts of the developing world. And that sometimes the moral intention is more interesting than the visual product. Yeah, we, we have an artist in residence program at Grace Cathedral, and it's it's so inspiring because it is art with a moral purpose. Um, and it, we're, we're so fortunate that people gravitate to places like cathedrals um, who have that that calling. It's a it's a vocation. You, you know, um, one of the last um, at the afterward of Far and Away, um, you you write about a lot about Donald Trump and just about what those four years were like. And I, I wonder if you've changed your mind about any of it, um, first of all, and then second of all, like, how did you decide to do that? And then, um, and then maybe if, as a third question, um, you know, what, what are those four years going to mean to us, you know, as, as we begin to, they begin to recede in, in the, in the rear view mirror. The stories that I wrote for Far and Away were written um, during a, a period of about 25 years. And the original hardback of the book was published during the Obama administration at a time when its arguments didn't seem particularly radical. But by the time that the paperback was being issued, Donald Trump was the president of the United States. And we were facing the Muslim ban and the sort of general fear of strangers and cruelty toward them and the um, hideous campaigns against immigrants and the separation of children at the borders. From a purely commercial standpoint, I wish the whole book had come out in that era because I think its arguments would have felt 
urgent to people in a way that they didn't in the Obama years. But I felt I couldn't just see the paperback come out and not comment on the fact that we had moved away from everything that I thought was moral and good and true and right, and that we had moved into a period of terrible, um, uh, terrible ill will. We have living with us still um, a Libyan refugee, someone I had met when I was in Libya in uh, the early 2000s, reporting on Gaddafi's Libya for The New Yorker, um, who had come over. Uh, he, we had gone through a very complicated process to get him refugee status, uh, and he came over, and then we were told that he was going to be sent to Nebraska. And I said, okay, he's a gay Muslim refugee. And I think Nebraska, rural Nebraska, may not be quite ready for him. And they said, well, we'll send him to New York only if he lives with you um, and if you guarantee his financial stability for the first six months. And here we are now um, five years later, and he is still living with us and became a beloved part of our household. But it meant that we, all the way through the initial cruelties of the Trump administration, were aware of them not merely as abstractions, but as something very real. And we've ended up having Hassan live with us because he's a wonderful person and part of our household. But we had him come to live with us because we felt we were so lucky in the life that we led as married gay men with children widely accepted in the society we inhabited, that we had a kind of impetus to um, extend whatever kindness we could to people who didn't share in that original good fortune. And so we we were aware through the Trump years that those people who were being targeted were people like someone who lived with us. And our children were aware when they heard those speeches in which foreigners were being attacked by a sort of xenophobic rage, were aware they're talking about people like Hassan when they say that. They're talking about people we love and whom we care about. And we got Hassan to go and speak at um, our son's school and did various other things, not to make a sort of huge production number out of that one relationship, but. I think that the Trump years have horribly scarred the United States. I think there was a sense for me during that period that a kind of um, a tough cruelty was seen as more attractive than compassion or forgiveness. And that a society in which that argument continued after he had been in office for four years to be sustained by almost half the country as being a valid and appropriate way to respond to fellow human beings it will take a generation for us to live that down if we do live it down. And if not, I'll have got my Polish passport and I'll be waving it to you from Krakow. <laughs> well, I've gotten some other, uh, I'll, I'll be across the channel from you and I'll wave to you from London. But I I, you know, I, I was thinking about that too, because you know, I was aware of that story, but um, I wonder, um, Hassan, like, how has he changed your, like, how does he change the kind of the family dynamic? Like, what have you learned from having somebody who, who comes from such a different, a, a different society and, and having, having him so close within your, within your, your nuclear family? I learned that there was a lot of elasticity in our nuclear family that I would not have anticipated necessarily before he came. And that, the intimacy that John and I feel with my son who lives with us, with my daughter who lives with her mother in Texas, um, uh, with, um, uh, uh, with uh, John's best friend uh, who lives with us as well, that, that there was room for more people in it. I mean, I felt, I thought the generosity that would be necessary was going to be very difficult. And I don't particularly sing my own generosity. I can be incredibly egomaniacal and self-obsessed and have done various things that have hurt other people terribly and so on and so forth. But I felt like the generosity around which we built our family had scope in it to expand. Now, Hassan is actually, he's charming and delightful and intelligent. And so it wasn't as though we had to make the kind of heroic effort that people made who took in refugees who came out of traumatized situations and were dysfunctional and didn't um, uh, use spoken language and so on. But, uh, but I felt like it was good to discover that. I, I grew up in a household in which I think my parents are effectively very generous people, but we led a very conventional life in many, many different ways. And it would never have crossed their minds to bring an extra person in to live with us. And 
I wasn't conventional and I had gone through the experience of growing up as a gay person in a relatively homophobic society. And I was determined um, really for my children though ultimately it served me as well that we grow up in a, a context of acceptance. And I think, I think Hassan's had a pretty happy time being with us. So he tells us at least. He's also faced real difficulties in adjusting to American life. And sometimes we've been able to help and sometimes less so. And recognizing what in our lives could be difficult for someone else and recognizing what in our society could be alien to someone else, I think has given us a, a keener grasp of what's specific to our situation and what's universal to the world. What's an example of that? Like something that from that for, from a North African's perspective is difficult, but something we would be surprised that was difficult. Well, I mean, I can give you examples that run a wide gamut. Uh, you know, he went to open a bank account and I said, oh, go to um, uh, the Chase Bank. That's where I have my account. And he came back and said, they won't let me open an account. And I said, but you have some money and you have no. And he said, no, they, they said that I don't have the, and I said, but you have status as a refugee, which is supposed to give you that right. And he said, well, I tried everything and they just wouldn't. And I then called someone higher up at the bank who I deal with and said, you know, I write for the New York Times. How would you like to see a story about the way you are treating immigrants and refugees when they come into the bank? Yeah. And he had a bank account within a couple of days. Yeah. So there's that sort of thing. But they're also, I mean, he grew up uh, as he has sometimes pointed out, as a gay man in a society in which that was unspeakable. Right, and yet through right. the refugee process, he was accepted as a refugee in large part on the basis that his life was in danger in Libya because he was gay. And he said he had to go to appointments over and over again with people who said, tell me about being gay and asked him very intrusive and highly specific questions about the extent of his sexual experience and the nature of his sexual practices. And he had over and over and over again to sort of recite these stories of what um, his personal life had been, stories he had worked so hard for so long to keep secret and quiet. And that was a terrible um, a trauma and a terrible burden for him. And then I think also he had been studying medicine in Libya. None of his credentials were recognized here. He's now an undergraduate again at the age of 36 because he was required to get an American undergraduate degree to go forward with medical work. Just There were just thousands of difficulties like that. And most recently, his mother to whom he had been very, very close was dying in Libya. And if he had gotten his Libyan passport renewed, that would have negated the refugee process because oh. it would have shown that he was not sufficiently afraid of Libya and that he perfectly well could go and live there. And yet, even though he applied for compassionate allowance, he was not given American travel documents. And so his mother died a few weeks ago and he was wow. here and she was there and he never got to see her in the final year of her life when she was suffering from cancer. Now, my mother also died of cancer, and she died when I was a similar age to Haas, and when my mother was a similar age to Hassan's mother, but I was at her bedside and sat with her the evening that she died. And the fact that that was obviously available to me and that it was completely unavailable to him was very sobering. There are difficulties in the world that are very different from the ones that most of us who are secure in our identity and social place don't necessarily have to negotiate. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things about the um, the new family values is just you, you you do a wonderful job of just kind of summarizing just how far we're, we've come with regard to the new families. And I wonder if you could just um, just kind of take us through that. I mean, because um, you're right, when you talk about your childhood, I mean, you, you were living in a deeply homophobic society that was, that was I mean, it, it, um, pathologizing your, your, your identity. And, um, and, and now we're in, we're, we're, you know, we're in a very different place. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how we've come along this road and, and, and just where we are in terms of, of, of new families and new family expressions. The life that I have as an adult is a life that was unimaginable when I was a child. It's not simply that I failed to imagine it. 
It's that it was unimaginable that I would grow up, that I would marry a man, that we would have a great big wedding that everyone in my family and all of my friends would come to, that we would go on to have children, that I would also have a child with my best friend from college, that we would all think of ourselves as a big family, the whole thing, um, even before you add in visiting um, refugees and friends, it was inconceivable. And you know, there are some people who when they reach a point of social acceptance, tend to think that they need to protect the territory of social acceptance by keeping too many other people from intruding on the island. And there are other people who feel that the thing to do is to reach out their hand and say, who's next? And I was very moved by the work of activists who said that who's next thing. And so as I've looked most recently actually for a, a story that I just did a few weeks ago for the New Yorker at polygamy and polyamory, I thought, right. why is it that we recognize marriage only as existing between two people? And what does it mean to give some form of legal um, recognition and possibly religious and possibly not, but certainly legal recognition to other kinds of relationships. And if we say that children of gay parents were unfairly stigmatized so long as their parents couldn't get married, then how can we say that children of polygamists are not stigmatized if their parents cannot have a recognized relationship? Or in the same way for polyamorists, even though polygamists appear to be of the extreme right and polyamorists of the extreme left. And what I really wanted to look at was how have all of these things worked? I have a number of friends who are single parents and they are single parents um, by, um, uh, by choice. And uh, you know, that too, I mean, the idea of being a single parent was shameful when I was growing up and I, I'm not that old. Um, and <laughs> nonetheless, you're um, very young. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you. Um, favors that zoom does you. Um, but, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to look at all these different forms of family. I wanted to look at adoption and how our understanding of it has changed in foster care. I wanted to look at divorce because the um, availability of divorce was really a product of the women's movement and the belief that women should be able to escape a marriage in which they were being mistreated or abused. I wanted to look at um, interracial marriage and at the way that um, uh, Loving v. Virginia in which miscegenation laws were finally defeated was the first time that people stood up and said to the government, you can't tell us whom we can marry, that is up to us. I wanted to look at how it's broadened and most of all what I wanted to look at was the fact that we continue over and over again to try to fit the new forms of family into a model that came out of 1950s America of an ideal nuclear family. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in an ideal nuclear family like that and I had a pretty good childhood and I really feel that it worked well, but it's not the only thing that works well. And so people will say to uh, my friend who's a single mother, oh, well, you have to be mother and father to that child. And I think, no, she has to be a single mother to that child and that's something different. And people will say to John and me, so which of you is really the mom? And I know what they mean and I know what they're getting at, but neither of us is the mom. George is growing up with two dads. There are advantages and disadvantages to having two dads and having us as his two dads. Um, the disadvantages I'm sure he'll recite as he gets older um, in great detail. But I just think there has to be scope for, um, for all these different relationships. And one of the people I uh, was talking to was a lesbian and I said, oh, as people say to John and me, which of you is really the mom? And she said, oh, she said, when people say that to us, I say, which chopstick is the fork? <laughs> That's a great answer. You know, um, those interviews, I, I was so surprised by it. I, I don't I, I, I don't listen to a lot of audible books, but I mean, um, there are some that really brought tears to my eyes. I, I, I you know, the conversations about the rainbow families and um, th there were a lot of moments that were really powerful. I, I, I wonder if, if, if there is any particular people from that book that you met that are kind of still with you um, in a special way that, I'm, that really stand out for you in terms of your, your memory of the project. There are a lot of people who, uh, whom I remember and a lot of the interviews I've gone back to and worked on as material for a book, which means that I worked on them at much greater length than I did in making the audio book because you use more material in a, a written book than in an audio book, yeah. they're longer. Um, 
you know, there were a lot of people, but one of the ones who really sticks with me, and it's interesting because when the story was proposed, I wasn't that interested in it. I was looking at the foster care system. I was trying to come to terms with the racism that is inherent in the foster care system. And I came across the story of a woman, or rather I met the woman herself. She has sickle cell anemia. Right. And she had a son with sickle cell anemia. And she had been told by her social worker that if her son's fever ever went above 102.5, she should immediately take him to the emergency room. And one night her son's temperature went up to 102.7 and she gave her son Tylenol and his fever went straight back down. And she knew because she herself has sickle cell anemia that if this were a sickle cell episode, Tylenol would not have brought his fever down. And so um, she knew that he was, that wasn't what he was having, but she wanted to play everything as cautiously as possible. And so the following day, she voluntarily took her son into the doctor and he said, what was the fever last night? And she said, it went up to 102.7. And he said, but you're mandated to bring your child to the emergency room if his fever goes above 102.5. And she explained about the Tylenol and that it was two o'clock in the morning. And the, so, and he said, but this, you're not fulfilling the orders that were given to you by your social worker. And she lost her child for an extended period of time, had to give up. She was working two jobs to try to support this child, had to give up one of the jobs so she could attend parenting classes that she didn't need all of it so that she could get back her own child. Meanwhile, constantly saying to the family he was staying with what sickle cell anemia was and what they should do and how they should deal with every situation, doing sort of parenting by telephone and the cruelty of that system and the idiocy of that system seemed so overpowering to me. There were some parents at my son's school who I thought were really terrible parents and their child has had a lot of problems as a result, I think at least in part of the terrible parenting he has received. And there was no concern that someone was going to show up at the door of their fancy apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and take their child away because they were judged incompetent. And here was this woman who was a loving and devoted mother and working so hard, so hard to bring up her child with dignity and with grace and her child was snatched away from her, leaving a permanent scar on her and a permanent scar on that child who will never again be able to feel, it's all okay, mommy will take care of me. He'll know unless there's a knock on the door and I get taken away again. I was, I mean, there were many stories that were arresting and disturbing, but there were few in which the injustice seemed so so broad um, and so ludicrous. Now, I, I, I remember that story. One of the saddest things about it to me was just how many days she sat in court and wasn't allowed to say a single thing as, as everything happened around her, as, as her future is determined and she's not allowed to even speak. And then when she finally does speak, the judge realizes just how competent she is as somebody who works in the field of medicine, her, the, 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 the woman does. I, I, yeah, I, that was a heartbreaking story. I mean, I, I just, I, I do, I got to say when I, I heard it too, I was, I was, I mean, it must be hard to take all of, all that pain in, uh, um, you know, th 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 uh, you know, for you as a writer, but you know, we have this tradition for you to take it in as um, a, a religious leader. So um. <laughs> we have, we have a, this great tradition here at, um, at, for, for the forum. And it is uh, that we take questions from our audience. They're always, they're, they're often very good questions. Um, so here, we're going to start going through them. Um, could you comment on what role adults, apart from parents, can play in the development and nurturing of young people, such as those of in faith and school communities? Can you suggest anything adults in these communities can and should think about? Well, I would begin by saying that the final chapter of both New Family Values and the book I'm working on, Who Rocks the Cradle, is about the so-called child-free family, in which I try to look at the ways in which our society privileges parenthood above other choices that people make in their lives. And I believe strongly that um, while I have loved having children and it's been the joy of my life 
mostly, um, I recognize that it's not what everyone wants to do or what everyone is able to do or what everyone ends up doing. And that it's very important if we're to have a society in which we all benefit from one another's strengths, that we acknowledge um, uh, the people who don't have children, people who are single, people who are in the Catholic priesthood, people who for a million different reasons, people who are married and don't have children, that they all have something um, to offer. And I also think that the idea of the nuclear family, which I talked about before as a 1950s ideal, is quite a modern invention and quite a flawed one that actually in order for anyone to grow up and be of sound um, mind, it's necessary to have many different adults involved. That old Hillary Clinton, it takes a village routine. And so I think certainly that, um, you know, that your, your priest or your pastor, um, that your aunts and uncles, that your godparents, that your teachers, that your doctors, that there are all kinds of people who have a beneficial effect on you and that different people are helpful in different ways at different stages of a child's life. And it's one of the it's one of the great acts of generosity for people to be willing to play those roles without being biologically tied to the children for whom they are playing um, those roles. And, uh, and I think that there should be more acknowledgement of them. In the best instances, of course, the children acknowledge those people in those roles as they grow up. Yeah, it's such an important thing. I, I you know, we, when we talk to godparents, um, just to talk about what kind of um, role and connection you can have with children, you can have a, make a profound difference in a child's life. It doesn't have to, well, one of the, my favorite things about the child free section too is you're talking about the a very high percentage of those child fee families are, are people who work in in child caring professions as as teachers or in 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 other as nurses or doctors or they have some relationship with children at, um, and uh, they just regard their ministry with children as different than being a parent. Um, here's another question that came in. It's from, from another person who must have read um, Far From the Tree. And it says, will you talk more about horizontal and vertical relationships as you did in Far From the Tree? Sure. So when I was working on Far From the Tree, I was struck by the fact that in most instances, children with a variety of special needs or differences or disabilities are born to parents who are unlike them. I began the project that ultimately turned into Far From the Tree by writing about the deaf for um, the New York Times. And it turns out that most deaf children are born to hearing parents. And I was struck as I did that work by the parallel with my experience as the gay child of straight parents. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And she started asking all these questions about whether she should bring her child up to be just like everyone else and tell her she's just kind of short or whether she should try to construct a dwarf identity of some kind for her. And as she narrated her concerns, I thought, oh, and I have discovered that most dwarfs are born to parents of average height. And so I was struck by how over and over again, there were these uh, people who were having uh, children who were different from them. And I said that there is a real difference between what I called vertical identities that get passed down generationally from parent to child, one's nationality, one's uh, language ordinarily, except in some cases of immigration, frequently one's religion. You know, you can say uh, one's ethnicity, certainly. You can say that there are difficulties associated with um, at various of these situations, but you grow up with parents who reinforce your sense of pride. So when we look at the fact that it is in fact, I think in many instances and in many ways, easier to be a white person than it is to be a black person in the United States as currently constituted, we recognize that that's a structural problem in our society and that society needs to change. We don't set out to do genetic research to ensure that the next generation of children born to black parents come out with blonde hair and blue eyes. But with all of these things that I call horizontal identities, horizontal because they are learned from your friend group. So being deaf, being gay, being autistic, being schizophrenic, being um, a prodigy, because most um, uh, children who are geniuses are born to parents who are not, so on and so forth. All of these ways that children can be different, whether they're constructed positively or negatively, that the parents don't really know what to do and that the society at large has attempted to come up with cures or treatments for those differences. And in some instances, that's been terrific. 
And in some instances, it's been very damaging and very dangerous, as I think is revealed by the strong movement now against corrective therapies for gay and transgender people. And so I really wanted in Far From the Tree, I feel like there's a lot right now on the vertical identities. You can find more books on um, race than at any time in our nation's history. But what about those horizontal identities? What about those qualities that you grow up with that instead of drawing you closer to your family, you know, we're Jews and we share this experience, alienate you from your family because they say, you're part of gay culture. I don't get it. I don't want to get it. I don't want anything to do with it. How do you how do you negotiate the horizontal identities? Yeah, I, I we had a, a family that had a, in, it was 90, 1994 that had their son was a, um, like 12 years old and had a cochlear implant. And I, I just remember um, your the chapter on on de uh, de deafness really brought that back of just like, what would you do if, if somebody, I mean, you know, there's like the connection between, it's hard for us to get out of the mindset of trying to fix things and, 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 and just recognize the identity as it exists. And some um, people who are deaf, many um, don't want to become hearing people. They want to be part of the deaf community. That's, that's their identity and they don't want it changed. And, and I think that's the, that's a really helpful thing to be thinking about is just like, how, how is your identity formed? Um, and I, 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 I like that distinction between the horizontal and the vertical identities. Okay, another um, question came in, and that is, um, besides encouraging people to read books such as this, what suggestions do you have to combat the painful stereotypes that exist about people with mental illness, which often keep people from seeking the help they need? Well, there are actually a couple of parts to that um, question. The sort of negative view of people with mental illness, I think will only be corrected as more and more people are out and open about the fact that they have mental illness. But there are many people for whom that comes at a steep price, either because of an internalized sense of shame or because they think they'll be passed over where they work um, or that nobody will want to marry them or whatever else it is that they fear will happen as a result of exposing themselves. But if people understood how many people around them have um, these differences, then I think the, the change would occur and the, the stigma would be diminished. Um, in terms of what we can do from the outside to change the stigma around mental illness, I think it's to um, broadcast stories of people who have succeeded, not in a way that makes people with mental illnesses who haven't been able to achieve those successes feel inadequate, but we should say, actually, there are a lot of people with mental illnesses who do very well. You know, I would have been thrilled if one of um, Biden's picks for the cabinet had schizophrenia. I think it would have made a huge difference. It's having people out in public places. Ellen Sachs, who does have schizophrenia um, and who is a law professor and has written about her experience, you know, has given hope to untold tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are, are dealing with schizophrenia and she would be um, well qualified to do anything, I think, within um, the world of the law. So there's all of that. And there's also, I think, trying to get rid of the negative stereotyping that exists in which newspapers constantly report, oh, there was an episode of violence, you know, it was a white guy, he probably had schizophrenia. There's a kind of constant attempt to um, rationalize away the violence that exists in our society by pinning it on people with mental illnesses who by and large are not the ones who are causing the violence in our society, but who in any event are certainly not in large numbers likely to commit such acts of violence. And I think media portrayals are terrible. And it was interesting when I was talking to the polygamists who have worked to decriminalize polygamy, and they said, we had to have a legal approach and we had to have a public relations approach. Mm -hmm. And they had constructed a legal approach, which was a very interesting one, but they also got sister wives on TV and they got other shows that were put on TV and they um, got books that went out into wider circulation. One of the issues for polygamists was that most people had never met one. And after all of that stuff went out on television, people felt like they sort of understood what it was about. Gee, it would be great if we could do that for mental illness more effectively than we have. And the mental illness for which we've done the best job and which is now the most destigmatized and the best treated is depression. And depression is only one of many mental illnesses. It's the one I happen to have, but it's only one of many mental illnesses and they all deserve that exposure and that justice. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't believe it. It was just like, we have one more minute left. <laughs> I'm so disappointed because I, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, um, when I was, as I was reading New Family Values, I thought, wow, you know, my, my calling, you know, may be to just be, be somebody who supports new families as they, as they emerge. I, I definitely felt that as I, as I was reading, as I was hearing the, 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 the book on, on the Audible books. But I wonder if, as we close out, if you can just um, tell us just what signs of hope you're seeing these days. What, 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 what what's in, what, what, what's the encouraging news that's that's out there that you're experiencing? Well, part of the encouraging news actually has been the shift within religion um, from a position of pitying um, and delivering um, uh, charity to people with uh, certain kinds of disabling conditions through to castigating people who are, for example, gay or transgender to greater acceptance. And I think that um, uh, the role of um, uh, the role of churches and of your church in particular, I haven't had a chance to talk to you about your work because that wasn't the structure tonight, but if your church in particular, the work of acceptance and the ability to explain to people that they are beloved of God, whatever it is that they are doing or however it is that they are living, um, I think has been one of the great, wonderful transformations that has taken place over these recent years. Certainly when my husband and I got married, the ceremony was performed by a pastor. The, um, there was a blessing from a rabbi um, uh, to acknowledge my Jewish heritage. We felt very much that we wanted the presence of God in what we were doing. And it would have been unimaginable, I think a decade or two earlier. And um, that has been a great sign of hope. And I think the fact that we're having this conversation um, and that people are watching it from wherever they may be is an indication that these are now acceptable topics. And that gives me enormous hope. Yes, me too, me too. Um, and I'm so grateful, Andrew, for that you said yes to, to our invitation. I know it's a, it's late there on the East Coast, but we're very, very grateful that you, and, and I'm just, I've got to thank you just for your your ministry, basically, of, of, of telling people that they're loved, that their lives matter, that their stories are interesting, and that they can be an inspiration to other people. I just, I think it's an amazing ministry, and I'm very grateful that there are people out there that are doing that kind of work like you are. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very grateful to you. And I'm very grateful to feel that we're all in this together. We are definitely all in this together. Please join me next week when my guest will be Bonnie Shui, um, author of Why We Swim. We'll be talking about what leads us to water despite its dangers and what that says about being human. We rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give on gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK to 76278. And again, thanks so much, Andrew Solomon, for being our guest tonight. And we look forward to um, the new book that the uh, New Family Values becomes when it, it comes into, into print. I think I'm going to enjoy the print version so much, I'm, I'm, but I'm glad I was exposed to the Audible, too. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good night, everyone. <laughs>